Does anybody have any questions? Delicious. <laughs> That's not a question. How <laughs> come you don't use the uh, red onion as <laughs> white onion? I mean, you use the, oh, you can, the, the, the white question onion. was the question that he asked up here was why did I use the red onion in the guacamole instead of the white onion? Because I like the, the light or less sweet flavor of the white onion. But if you like the red, use the red. It's it's delicious in guacamole. And we had a question back here. Yes. Yeah. Um, as far as like Mexican cheeses, can you just kind of give like your favorites and like you know what you know best applications for those are? If you'll notice that the best cheeses in the world come from very temperate mm -hmm. climates. Think about Central Europe. That's the place with, with the greatest amount of, uh, of uh, history with cheeses. Mexico is not that kind of a, of a climate. So all the cheeses are typically fresh cheeses. So we have queso fresco, which is like farmer's cheese or sort of like feta cheese. And it's used as a garnishing cheese. There is a, an aged version of the same thing that is um, called queso añejo that is a very, very similar to the flavor of Romano cheese. So if you can't find a good queso añejo, use Romano to sprinkle over. Again, it's a garnishing cheese. The whole idea of melted cheese all over every Mexican dish is only American. There's only a couple of dishes in the entire repertoire of Mexican cooking that have melted cheese on them. So that's why a lot of times when people go to Mexico, they're surprised because they're thinking it's all going to be real heavy food with cheese melted over the top of it. That is the American version of Mexican food. You can see what I've got here has none of that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. Um, muchas gracias for bringing the flavor from Mexico to the U.S. Oh, Thank you very much. So you so, got to use this. Stuff. I did, I did. And he spoke very fondly of you. Oh, very nice. He's a great guy. Um, so do you have a particular region that you really like and you can't include Mexico City? Okay. The question was, <laughs> do I have a certain part of Mexico that I really like um, for sort of culinary reasons? I'm going to come down here and I'm going to grab this mic. I can repeat here. I can repeat here just so that everybody else can hear. But um, the question was about whether I have any a part of Mexico that I like for culinary reasons. And um, I don't know why you're keeping Mexico City out of it, because that's the hottest place in the whole country. Right now, the art scene and the food scene in Mexico City is off the charts. I have a whole lot of stuff on my website about Mexico City. So if you're interested in going there, you can find a lot of my latest explorations of places in Mexico City. Now, the... Uh, I always recommend to people the triangle. Now, the, she had been down to a really good cooking school in Merida, Yucatan, that makes food that's sort of out of the same mold as the shrimp that I did today. That cooking school is called Los Dos, really good. It's an American guy who has settled there and teaches cooking classes, but he's really deep into the culture. So it's not sort of an Americanized version. He gets the real thing to you. And I highly recommend if you're going to visit the, the Yucatan Peninsula, and I know a lot of people like it because there's such great beaches that you could do, but don't miss Merida. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful city. And you could take cooking classes at Los Dos. You can find them at losdos.com on the, on the internet. So, um, the, but where I usually send people is a triangle between Puebla, which is east of Mexico City, and is very classic, old-fashioned, central Mexican food. And then you go to straight east to Veracruz, where you get some absolutely beautiful seafood, lighter fare. Then go down south, where you get the most indigenous food, which is Oaxaca. And so if you think of that sort of triangle, as the culinary um, mecca of Mexico, you'll have really, really gotten into the cuisine. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes, ma'am. What, um, what species of seafood is your favorite to cook with, with uh, all the Mexican flavor? Um, the question was, what, what type of fish do I like to cook with for Mexican food? Um, I, I don't usually answer best kinds of questions because that's like asking an artist, what's your favorite color? <laughs> I mean, you can't do without all, all of them. They all have their place. Um, I say I am super into working um, as a responsible chef, and so I, sus I really support uh, sustainable fisheries. And if you want to 
do the same, then one of the things that you have to know, and in the United States, the only one that has been sort of MSC, uh, the Marine Stewardship Council certified, is the, the one in Alaska. So all that Alaskan stuff we use a lot in our restaurant. However, we work with a guy in Hollywood, Florida that works with very small day boat fishermen. And we've worked with him for 15 years. And he works with small amounts of different things. And um, so I typically what you find in Mexico is all the warmer water species. So a lot of mahi-mahi, a lot of snapper and grouper. All of the stuff that you folks have here oh. is the same stuff that is eaten all throughout Mexico. So, but I, you have to look at it, and if you want to learn a little bit more about sustainable fish, then I recommend that you go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium website, and they have a whole section there that tells you what, about, what the health of a particular species is and from where. And it's very complete, and it's very easy to use. If you have an iPhone, you can get, the, you can get it as an iPhone app. And I, I recommend it to everybody because then when you're in the grocery store, you can just look on your phone and see what are they saying about American Red Snapper right now? Is it healthy or is it not? And it updates regularly so you can get really good stuff from that. Yes, ma'am. Chef, the, um, you were talking about the achiote and uh, lime juice and uh, making that in your marinade. Yes. Does that flavor blend well with a lot of other flavors? Uh, that's a good question. This marinade that I made with the achiote, lime juice, and orange juice, or just achiote and lime juice, um, that is, you, that's what's used to marinate the pig for cochinita pibil. A lot of times people do the same preparation, but they do it with chicken. I love to do this with chicken thighs. And you marinate it. The, the marinade. You put the marinade on them. Let them set for half an hour or so. You don't really have to let the shrimp set because it just absorbs the the flavors really fast. But chicken thighs, I let them go for about half an hour, and then grill them and do the same thing with the sauce and the pickles on top of it. It's really super delicious. And any kind of fish fillet will work beautiful on the grill with this kind of a marinade. I, I have to take somebody from the back. Is there anybody that has questions in the back? Yes, ma'am. I'm. I'm just. I'm. I. I we have a private little discussion going on up here, so I'm going to try to open it up to the rest of the room. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Good. I'm so glad you like it. In Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been asked many times today, when are, when are we opening, fr opening Frontera in Orlando? Um, uh, thank you all. I, I appreciate that all very much. I, I just don't like to commute. See, that's my problem. I have three restaurants, and they're all next door to each other, so I can literally walk from one to the other. So um, that tells you a little bit about me, but I am going to continue to work on PBS. We're in production now for a new series that will be out uh, next year, probably in the spring, and it is focusing on Baja California. Hardly anybody knows the treasures that are in Baja California, and everybody should know about them, because the wine growing region there is off the charts. The chefs, there are so many amazing chefs, and of course a lot of people, not so much from this side of the United States, but from the western coast, all go down to Cabo San Lucas, and it's a really beautiful place. And I want to help people to understand what you can do to get off the tourist track and into the real culture that's there, and into the sea food that's there because you know the waters of the Sea of Cortez, the inland part there, um, is they're, they're the richest in seafood of any place in the whole world. So it's really cool to, to all the things that we've discovered. So we're going to be focusing our next series a lot on that part of Mexico. There was another question someplace up here. Yes, sir. When you decided right. to start writing books, yes. did you have to take certain classes or special instructions or how you know, I, I said that I came from a family of restaurant people, and um, the question was, did I, when I decided to write, start writing books, did I have to sort of go to classes and learn how to do all of that? Well, I came from a family of restaurant people and tried to get away from it for a while because I could see my steps going straight into inheriting my parents' restaurant, and I knew it was going to be too confining for me. I wanted to do my own thing. 
So I studied Spanish language, literature, Latin American studies, and then I went to graduate school in linguistics and anthropology because I was thinking at one point that I wanted to really focus just on the culture of Mexico, only to wake up one day and say, the culture is completely within the food system of Mexico, and I'm just going to focus on what I love, which is food, and Mexico, and put the two of them together, and do Mexican food as an expression of culture. That's what food is. It's an expression of culture. And so this is, that's why I always try to put everything in its cultural context when I'm teaching about things. So I had a really strong academic background, and I had done loads of writing for my, my programs. So uh, I didn't take any, but a lot of people do. And there is, um, there's certain, if you decide you want to write a cookbook, there's certain things that you have to know about how to write a recipe. And um, the interesting thing, if, you want to, if you're thinking about going that way, look at what they do at Cook's Illustrated. That's probably the be those are probably the best written recipes in the United States. They're very, very reliable, and you'll see what they think is, is necessary information to put in a recipe. Not too much, not too little. Yes, ma'am? Your uh, best kept secret in Chicago, I think, is fresco. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, Tamales, yes. What is the sauce on there? I would like that recipe. It's a roasted tomatillo <laughs> sauce. So she was saying, for those of you who couldn't hear, that she thought the best kept secret that we had have in Chicago is these little kiosks. We have them in uh, two Macy's stores in Chicago, and uh, downtown it's on the seventh floor of yeah. the old old one, and we're, um, uh, we have this little place that, in the food court up there where we do very simple fare. And one of the things that we do is these little sweet corn tamales. And they have a roasted tomatillo salsa. And it's in every single one of my books. Anything that I have has got a roasted tomatillo salsa in it because to me, it's the elixir of life. I would never write a book without having it in there because that's the thing I turn to more than anything to kind of perk things up. Okay, one more question. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I have, I'll, I'll answer you privately. I have to go to the back of the room, okay? That's going to be our last question. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to make this into a good one. So, um, a lot of people have corn tortillas that are stale and taste like a cardboard box, right? And so that's one of the reasons that everybody wants to use flour tortillas, because they're at least palatable. Corn tortillas, just so that everybody knows, have no fat in them. And fat is one of the things that preserves things. And they have no salt in them because they're made to balance with the rest of the full flavors of the cuisine. So corn tortillas are eaten by 99% of the people in Mexico. Flour tortillas are eaten by 99% of the people in the United States. Okay, we're much more of a wheat-based culture and all that. In Mexico, because everybody's eating corn tortillas, they have fresh ones available to them at every, in every neighborhood. There's a little tortilleria where they're making fresh ones. You can go down there, buy them, take them right home, and eat them. And when they're left over, they usually have dishes like enchiladas or chilaquiles or something like that that they make out of the stale ones. And when they say stale, they mean cold from lunch, and this is dinner time, okay? Not three weeks old. Half the time when we get them in our stores, they're weeks and weeks old. If you have a local tortilla factory, then certainly go for those above all else. But they're almost always going to be cold. So here's what I recommend you do. Take two squares of, of paper towel and get them completely wet and wring them out. Lay them out, one on top of the other, put a dozen tortillas in there, fold that thing over, put them into your microwave, full power, one minute. Let them set for two minutes. They'll be amazing. Because the this, this steam of the paper towel will start to penetrate the tortillas. And they'll soften up again. And they'll taste really, really good. It's very, very easy to do. And it's, we used to do it a little bit in a plastic bag. Same kind of thing, but in a plastic bag. And it was trapping too much heat. And so we now just do it two layers of paper towels, completely wet, squeezed out, put them, uh, wrap, a, wrap around a dozen tortillas in one minute and let them set for two. It's really easy. Thank you all so much. You've been absolutely amazing.